Welcome to 52 Miniatures, my name is Alex and this video is sponsored by Into the AM, makers of this lovely shirt. Now I'm in the midst of scratch building this lighthouse, it's for my 6x4 foot gaming table. As you can see I'm off to a head start, we'll get to how we got to this point in just a sec, but I wanted to say that this technique of making the brick work, a really simple technique, uh, is just great for curved structures and is obviously not reserved for just a lighthouse. This could be any tower or things like that. Uh, it also works real well on flat surfaces, just walls. And so let's have a look how we got this far and let's finish off this little lighthouse. This very simple design is based on an empty bottle of window cleaner that I will cover with strips of air drying clay. By the way, I filmed this first stage of construction on my phone at home, and so we're rewatching it on Fantasy TV. We'll be back in the bunker shortly. The most common air drying clay out there is Daz clay, but out of curiosity I tried using Mr. Diorama clay for the first time. I really like it, but it's a bit more expensive than Daz clay. Air drying clay does not need to be cured in an oven, it cures, as the name suggests, simply by exposure to air. The bottle in question, something I found in my recycling bin, seemed like just the right size for a miniature lighthouse. I wrapped a piece of paper around the bottle and cut it so that the two ends meet. I could then flatten out a sheet of clay using a baking roller, or in my case a wine bottle, matching the size of the paper, giving me a sheet of clay the same size as the surface of the bottle. The sheet of clay is about 2 to 3 millimeters thick. I can now cut the clay sheet in strips and start wrapping around the bottle. I start with the rather wide strip for the lowest level, leaving a gap for a future gatehouse and glue it in place using wood glue or carpenter's glue. I can then proceed cutting thinner strips for the brickwork. I score in lines to represent every brick with my knife, making sure not to cut all the way through. Oh, and I keep a moist towel on top of the clay sheet to keep it from curing on me. I glue the thinner brick scored strips on in an alternating pattern to make it look like brickwork, leaving a little gap that I can fill in later. Somewhere along the way I cut a hole in the bottle representing a cannon blast or some other disaster. Also, this saved me having to roll out another sheet of clay as I forgot to measure in the very top of the bottle. And for the top I made a nice little collar. When attaching it I made sure I could still screw on and off the lid as I would be trying to get some lights going in there further down the road. And this is what everything looks like when dry. Air drying clay shrinks when it dries as moisture from the clay evaporates. This works great for a brick structure like this, because when the clay shrinks, each brick is pulled away from the surrounding bricks, creating this very natural brick or stonework look. There can be a struggle with air drying clay cracking during the curing process. This happens when the surface layer of clay dries a lot faster than the core. A way to avoid this is to cure the clay in a more moist environment, like putting a moist cloth on top or something like that. In this case, I tried to enhance the cracking as I thought it would look nice to have rugged and cracked edges on the stone, so I cured the tower in direct sunlight in my window. And so we've now created this lovely brick texture all around this lighthouse or tower. We're obviously left with gaps in between the bricks and I want to fill that up because, you know, there should be mortar or something like that in between the bricks. And I was thinking of what to use. At first I thought I'd use tile grout, which is a great thing to have around if you're working with terrain. Um, but it does take quite some time to dry and so instead I'm going to go for this wall filler um, only because it dries in 30 minutes. The wall filler has a nice grit to it that will look like mortar in the end, and applying it is a simple matter of smearing it on, making sure to fill all the gaps, and then to wipe off excess with a damp cloth. I set out on this little project with simplicity and accessibility in mind. This is not a complex and detailed diorama, rather a scenic piece for tabletop gaming or a model railway. 
Something you can build and paint in a weekend while your lawnmower stares back at you with contempt. I'm only going to use materials that should be cheap and available to most. And while the wall filler dried, I started looking into ways to add an actual light to this build. The cap for the window cleaner has a perfect shape and hole for it. The easiest light source is probably getting one of these battery-powered Christmas tree decoration style LEDs. I found mine cheap in a hardware store. For this we would only need one LED and so to use this option we would have to hide the remaining lights inside the tower. As well as cut a hole in the bottom to get the battery pack in. Another possible option is LED tea lights. These are really easy to open up and inside is a nice protruding LED. Unfortunately, this does not quite fit into my bottle cap. It might fit into yours. If not, bear it in mind for other applications like drilling a hole in a miniature building wall. Just pop this through from the inside and you can have some nice and simple lighting effects. I settled for the most complex solution. Some time back, Green Stuff World sent me this pack of exceptionally tiny red LEDs with a little battery power source. This is complex because it needs to be soldered together. As I've never soldered before, I of course chose this option. Curiosity killed the cat, or at least burnt its paws. This LED is quite weak compared to the other lights, but I figured since my build is going to be slightly ruined, possibly on the verge of derelict, just a low red light fits right in. And you know, if I ever change my mind, I can just screw the cap off and change it out for another option. Before we get on to the rest of the build, it's time to talk about my good looking shirt and the kind sponsors of this video, Into the AM. Into the AM creates expressive apparel, cool t-shirts, shirts, hoodies and more. I'm, as subscribers to this channel know, a man who wears shirts. But there's nothing like the feeling of walking down a beach in an excessively comfortable t-shirt with a flying saucer on it. I mean, come on. There's even a cactus in there. And don't get me started on the squid in a bottle t-shirt. I mean, who doesn't want a squid in a bottle t-shirt? But seriously, Into the AM has these great graphic tees that I actually like, both feel and design, and that's coming from a not very t-shirty person. The flannel shirt I've been wearing for the rest of this video is totally up my alley. It feels pretty resilient, perfect crafting in a bunker apparel, and I kind of want to get my hands on more. There's a grand selection of designs to check out on Into the AM's website and some good deals too. I've been very pleased with the quality and feel of mine and Into the AM are avid fans of hobby creators. So if you're in need of some new clothing, please check them out. Click on my link down in the description to get 10% off your purchase. And thank you Into the AM for sponsoring this video and creators like myself. Now after that refreshing inspirational trip to the sea, let's get back to the lighthouse. We now need a doorway and I thought I might as well build a little house-like structure. This will look more interesting as well as add stability to the tower, making it less likely to knock the thing over when gaming. I'm using foam core to build the foundations. Foam core is very handy to have around if you plan to build miniature structures every now and again. But cardboard would work fine as well as none of this will be seen in the end. I'm not paying excessive attention to scale. The doorway should be in the same realm of fitting 28mm or 32mm miniatures. A tight squeeze for a space marine, very accessible for others. But in the end, gaming terrain is a lot about symbolism and not realism. A door still looks like a door, even if it's not in perfect scale. But a trick is to have a regular sized human miniature from whatever game you play the most and see if things look passable. I'm now going to cover this base structure with wooden ice cream sticks. This is universal crafting material, comes free with your ice cream or can be found in bulk in craft stores or online. I'm going for a wooden look, but there is nothing saying that you can't just cover a build like this with clay in the same way as on the bottle. Oh, and I've also got some wooden matches uh, without the fiery bit on them. By brushing the wood with a wire brush, we can enhance the wood grain. The sticks can be rather easily divided into smaller strips. Beware of cutting yourself, uh, said the cat with the burnt paws. 
I glue these on using my hot glue gun. This is because it's fast. Something like white glue, a wood glue or carpenter's glue works great as well. I build a door and then continue on adding strips of wood like paneling. A build like this I sort of design while working, trying different pieces out one piece at a time, imagining something that looks built by tiny little carpenter hands in a tiny little world and not by the now severely injured cat. The end result this time is maybe a bit more medieval looking than I'd planned from the start. Kinda looks like a vintage privy uh, stuck to the side of this lighthouse, but I mean, when you've got to go, you've got to go. For the top platform, I kept using the same ice cream sticks. I mean, every respectable lighthouse needs a platform up top. And it's a nice spot to place miniatures in game. With a piece of cardboard cut to a suitable platform size for reference, I attempted an octagonal shape. The width of two ice cream sticks would be enough space for most regular miniature base sizes. I used super glue for this to be able to keep working fast. In hindsight, I probably should have had a solid round object in the middle while building. Something to press the strips of wood to, preventing the sort of skewed build that happened when building just by eye. My platform turned out a bit crooked, but when in place it still looks pretty fine. For visual interest, I added some supporting beams to the underside of the platform and the build was done. All in all, this was a pretty efficient build, but I'm very pleased with how it came together. The platform really sells the lighthouse idea and the outhouse is handy after last night's curry. I primed everything white and by the look of things I should probably change the filter in that spray booth. Oh and I forgot to mention, previously I'd actually primed the cap black and blasted in a bit of black spray on the inside of the lighthouse. I also dusted the cap with a bit of white to get a sort of grey zenithal effect. Painting this is going to be relatively swift. Again, I'm thinking of this as a terrain piece, maximum visual impact and not too much detailed work. Well, it's uh, still me, but I'm going to try my hardest to be swift. I'm also going to be a bit budget friendly and not use any airbrush, as well as toddler friendly and not use any solvent based paints. Don't dip your baby in the streaking grime. For the wood I'm going to use Wild Wood and Agarus Dunes Citadel contrast paints. Mixing on the model as I go. The Agarus Dunes is really quite yellow, but I like this for wood on the tabletop. In the end, we usually find ourselves with a lot of browns and greys, mud, dirt, concrete, stone, when building miniature worlds. And personally, I think trying to add colour makes for a more interesting experience. Red or yellowish wood, blue or reddish stone, and so on. But a quick step back in a dissection on my choice of white primer. The transparent contrast style paints work best over bright primers. But my main reason for starting with white is because the lighthouse itself will be predominantly white. And that's not something I want to try and paint on with a brush on top of some other coloured primer. If my intention for the lighthouse would instead have been an orange brick tower or a yellow silo, I would have primed only the tower build in a suitable base colour and either masked off or primed the bits I'm painting with contrast paint separately with the white. Aiming to prime with the colour you actually need in the end is a great time saver. While my wood contrast paint was drying, I decided to assemble the lead lighting. I painted the cap with a dark grey basilicum grey. I also found this little round crystal shaped bead in a bag of similar beads uh, that I bought at some point because when building fantasy terrain one never knows when a crystal will come in handy. This gives a nice fun spread of light when placed over the lead. I mixed up some green stuff and squeezed it in around the thin lead light cable, painted the green stuff white and then glued on the crystal with some white glue. For clear plastics like this bead, it's a good thing to remember that super glue fumes can cloud clear plastic. So you're best off using white glue or Elmer's glue or something similar. Now my lighthouse obviously needs red stripes. This is a lighthouse thing. Multi-use terrain is great and the red stripes will reduce my chances of using this build as a wizard's tower, but they will utterly sell the effect of a lighthouse, so I can't not do it. Some masking tape to give me some nice straight lines and then I just brushed on red. 
This is a bold Pyrrol red from Proacryl with a little burnt orange mixed in to mute things down. I thinned down the paint with water to avoid brush texture and needed three layers brushed on to get full coverage. If you have an airbrush, this is clearly a great time to bring it forth. After a little bit of cleanup with white paint, all the base colors were now in place and it's time to weather and stain this thing. Obviously, this is all optional, but as I make predominantly terrain for miniature, grim and dark war games, wear and tear kind of comes with the territory. By use of sponge, I'm going to create chipping. I dip the sponge in paint, dip it again on some paper to make sure there's not too much paint in the sponge, and then chip away. Sponging on the white like this makes it look like the red has been chipped off. I can then go in with a brush for some more excessive chipping, following the edges of the bricks where it kind of feels natural to have paint chipped off. I'm being pretty efficient in my application as the point of all this is for a visual excitement from about three feet away and not an up and personal inspection. I then repeat the process with a grey paint. This symbolises the fact that the white paint also has been chipped off, revealing the grey stone blocks underneath. With a brush I make sure to get some grey paint on the previous white chipping as well. However much you want to ruin your building is of course a personal matter, but this technique works great on any surface that you want to add a chipped effect to. A final fast and light-handed dry brush with a bright grey that adds a feeling of dirt and wear but also defines all the protruding bricks. And then on top of that, some watered down washes. I've got a black and a brown wash just to stain and tint everything into a bit of coherency. Also to get everything just a little bit further away from that still rather stark and bright white. Now this is definitely tabletop worthy. Pop that down on your gaming table, play games on it, it looks fine. Yeah, but I want to add just a little bit more character, a bit more color to make it pop. And these are things, simple things that you could use for any terrain, uh, just to make it look a little bit more special. Okay, so this is definitely a level up situation. None of this is needed for a simple terrain piece, but it will add an extra dimension. The first and most boring step is to define the bricks a little. I'm not edge highlighting everything, just painting on a bit of watered down white on some of the edges here and there. Adding a bit of definition as well as randomness. Solid white is kind of boring, but having some brighter bricks in amongst the stained ones just adds interest. We're then going to add shading and streaks using just regular acrylic paints. This is a great time to take out your oil paints if you have them. But as I'd like to show, you can use standard paints. No need for any specialized streaking products. First, I mix a thin down black and a thin down dark teal created by adding some blue and green to black. I'm going to paint this on where I feel a need for some shading or just dark staining. For example, separating the red and white lines with a stained shade. Like dirt that has accumulated over the years. I paint on the thinned paint and then rinse my brush in water and go back and try and erase the previous brush stroke into something like a gradient. Then repeating the process once the first layer is dry to gradually build up a starker shadow. I add bluish shadows under the roof of the wooden building where a shadow would normally appear if this was standing under a miniature sky. And just continue working my way around adding dark teal shadows where I feel they're needed. With a diluted straight black I can then start painting on streaks using a similar technique, drawing a line, erasing the edges, repeat. Step by step building up the streaks. The soot from an old explosion or a fire, or just streaks from years of rain and whatnot. This is one of those things that can totally take over your life and after an hour or something you've ended up with more streaks than you wanted because you had too much fun learning how to do them. So I tried to every now and again put the piece down, step away and ask myself if I think it looks cool from a distance. If it does, it's time to stop. A last dash of colour, because colour is important, remember, is to add some moss by use of the same sponge technique seen previously. I sponge on an outline in a darker green. 
then water down the paint and brush on paint to sort of connect the various green sponged areas. Then I add some yellow to the green or just pick a brighter green and carefully stipple that on top of the previous work. Now all these things can of course be done in colours that suit what you're working on. The black soot streaks could be done in muted orange for rust streaks. The green moss could be brown for a more muddy vibe. But both are rather simple ways of using the regular acrylic paint you've got to weather your terrain. My cap, for example, did get a sponging of orange to make it look a bit rusty. And as the final strawberry on this rather derelict excuse of a cake, I happened to find a little plastic cap from this lavender oil that was just meant to go on top of the lighthouse. Perfect fit, can't believe it. And I now have a glass covering for my lighthouse that for strange reasons has not broken regardless of bombardment and injured cats. To compensate, I smeared on a thin layer of sepia wash to stain the glass a little. And that was it. A for me surprisingly efficient build, but still a long video. But that also kind of comes with the territory. Thank you for making it through to the end. I hope there's things in here that can be translated into any terrain build and not just specifically for this lighthouse. Please do like and subscribe. Tell your friends, tell your mum. I want to thank Into the AM for sponsoring this video. And as always, a great thank you to my patrons. If you're new here and have become a fan of the channel, please don't hesitate to check out the Patreon. Thank you for watching this epic tale from the hobby realm, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.